Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. So, 10 years ago, I made a video that I think is one of the most interesting videos that I've ever done. It is basically a development time lapse of my very first Steam game called Survivor Squad. I'm actually currently working on my 8 or 9 Steam game. I don't even know how many in total I've made so far. So, I thought it would be fun, let's rewatch this video and I'll give you some notes and see how things have changed in the 10 years since I've been using Unity. Alright, so it starts off right away on the super old, I believe this is Unity 3.5. So this old interface definitely looks quite a bit dated right now. All the buttons with the gradients, kind of funny how you can just look at a UI and be able to see just how old it is. And for the game itself, you can see here is the very beginning. So at the beginning of development, I really just had the basic field of view mechanics. So that was kind of the core thing of the game. I had a character that I could click and move around and over there you can see the character has its made and the blue thing over there is actually the pathfinding that's another thing that was absolutely essential and it's actually another thing that I at the time had no skills I was not able to do it by myself so for this you can see over here the ASAR this is actually the ASAR pathfinding project this is an asset that I've talked about many times on this channel it's pretty much the best pathfinding solution and back then since I did not have the skills of making super fast pathfinding I just used this asset I used the free version pretty much right up until the actual release of the game and it was great by using this asset I was actually able to bring my vision to life. So yeah, being able to rotate and look around that was really interesting. There you can see the pathfinding, you can see the new map, you can see the path being calculated and right there the doors, this is actually really interesting. Again this was 10 years ago, this was being developed uh, back in 2013. And back then, Unity did not have any 2D tools, so there was no 2D specific engine. So over here, that is why you can see these doors, these door sprites, which you can't really see there because it's a bit too dark. But those doors, those are essentially just cubes. Those are cubes using 3D colliders, 3D physics, all of that. That is pretty much how I made it work. So the camera is top down in orthographic mode, but the actual game, the actual objects, everything over here, it's all in 3D. Honestly, when I made this, when I made the actual doors moving around, that was really awesome. I really enjoyed making that. It's something that is so simple, just being able to add some physics. Right there, just have the door open as the character moves. That is one of those things that is so simple and so satisfying. Then over here for actually interacting with the objects, being able to go there, interact with an object and a bunch of items come out. And down here we can also see a bit of the UI work. We can also see the zombie units start to appear. So the whole game is all about survivors versus zombies. So there you go, some basic interactions, some basic attacks with zombies. Once again, lots of 3D objects and some quads on top. Then using a bunch of points, I believe these were the spawn points. So basically, as soon as I played the game, there was a script that would go through every single one of these points and decide either to spawn an object there, like a zombie or something, or make them actually roam around. You can see over there that I was using prefabs in order to set up the blocks for the actual cities. So the final game actually has quite a bit of interesting procedural generation. So all the levels are randomly generated and they are randomly generated based on these parts, so these blocks. So I pretty much handcrafted a bunch of pieces and then simply put them together randomly. So there you go, going in, opening the door, and yep, it causes the visibility, then it automatically starts to attack. So we're here trying to handle some uh, AI logic that was really interesting. Then starting to deal with the uh, click and drag in order to actually move the player in that direction. Then over here, this is one of the things that was really tricky. This took a ton of work to make it work properly. This is essentially the persistent fog of war method. So you can see as the player looks around, there's a darker area and a semi-darker area. So pretty much like you have on any kind of RTS game, but making it here in this game with this kind of granularity, this was really difficult. Look at that, as the character moves, it slowly reveals more and more of the map. And yep, look at that, it's constantly being revealed and with multiple characters and so on. So yeah, this part was really extremely difficult. First, it was extremely difficult just to get it working, and then it was even more difficult to make it actually performant. Basically, the way that I did is kind of like a grid system on top. So on top of the entire game, I've got pretty much just the world split into grids, and pretty much just got tiny quads on every single position above the world. And then when a player unit, when it calculates this field of view, it basically goes into all of those quads and says, okay, is this one revealed or not? And swaps a boolean in order to actually generate the mesh underneath or not. But again, making this work was super difficult. Even on a relatively small map, that still required generating like tens of thousands of quads on top and doing all the logic on the raycast in order to figure out which ones to show, which ones to hide. This was one of the places where I first realized the super importance about memory optimization and specifically when to use classes versus when to use structs. I covered differences between those two in a previous video that is super important. 
basically how classes are reference types and they are stored a certain way in memory, whereas structs are value types, so they are stored in a different way. And over here, I remember this system, this was pretty much unusable when using classes, basically because the memory had to jump around all over the place. But when I swapped the structs, everything became much, much faster. Which is kind of funny because right now, 10 years later, Unity Dots is finally out of preview, it's finally 1.0, and using Dots, that would make this system much, much easier to build. So there you go, all of them moving, and look at that, everything being revealed. It's kind of funny how as a player you take these kinds of mechanics for granted, but I remember this was quite a nightmare to actually build. And then over here, the random generation for the node logic. These are basically all the cities. So the red cities, those have some infected. So basically you would move there, then clear the infected, then move away, move to a different place, and so on. I remember how generating this logic was actually some pretty fun programming. Basically the way it works is there are a whole bunch of different circles on different distances. So it kind of gets those in order to generate the various positions for the cities to be placed. And then you can see there's a logic for calculating the connections. Again, all of this is procedurally generated. So it kind of tries to randomly connect some cities together. Then also it had to make sure that there were some connections between the various circles, the various positions, so that every one of them is reachable. I remember this was really fun to work on. This is one of those problems that is really very programmer focused, which for me that is perfect. That is exactly the kind of problems that I like to solve. And yep, there you go, every time that I click, there's a brand new map, really nice. Then over here, starting to see some UI, so that was interesting, starting to see the visibility, and even the backpack, that was another one that was really tricky to make it actually performant. Then starting to add more logic for actually scavenging for resources in order to be able to find them and pick them up. Then trying to figure out the loadout, trying to handle the different survivors, this was also another thing that was quite tricky. You can obviously see all of the programmer art that I used. <laughs> you can obviously see how back then I had no idea how to use the Assessor. I don't even know if the Assessor actually exists back then. So all the art that you're seeing here, the reason why it looks terrible is because I drew all of this myself. <laughs> and you can see over there the UI going up and down, showing, then click to drag, move all of the positions and so on. Yeah, that was really interesting. Setting up the loadout for those. I don't actually remember how I actually did this. Did I use some kind of grid system? I'm actually not entirely sure. Just last year, I think, I made a really interesting Tetris grid inventory system. That's a really fun system. That is kind of what I did over here. So different items, they've got different shapes. So you got to click and drag in order to place them anywhere. And then you can equip some weapons, some armor, some backpack, and so on. So that was a really interesting system. Then over here, starting to see the tooltips. So implementing the danger level. So different nodes, they've got different danger levels. Some only have a handful of zombies, some have tons of them. Then the enlarged node, so once again that goes back to the procedural generation, so some levels are really big and some are really small. Then also the gas cost, so how much is it going to cost to actually get there and get back. That was a really interesting mechanic. Also over there, the randomly generated names for the actual cities. That one as well as the survivors. It's kind of funny, I remember looking up just random lists, random names of cities and people. I had those lists of names to my utilities in order to be able to randomly generate some names. And those are actually still there, so if you want to see the actual names that I use in the entire game, you can see them in my utilities. Then working quite a bit more with the AI and with the enemy visibility. Building some kind of health system. Oh, then handling the animation. So this was another thing that was really interesting and really tricky. You can see how the character, the survivor, this is actually made up of tons of different pieces. So basically there's a quad for the head, then one for the body, then one for the upper arm, one for the lower arms, and the legs and so on. So everything is separated into different body parts, different game objects. And this actually became a real big issue in terms of performance, which I'm not sure if I mentioned over here in the rest of this video. But basically the problem was that I could only have like 10 or 20 infected at the same time, because if each character is made up of like 10 or 15 different game objects, that really makes things really heavy really quickly. My solution ended up being making some kind of tool where I could take all of these animations and pretty much just make them into sprite sheets. And that way then the enemies, they are simply only one quad where it's constantly rotating the sprite sheet. Once I did that, then I was able to handle hundreds of infected and everything worked great. But yep, in the beginning, it all worked just like this, manually making the animations. Again, I didn't know how to use assets, so I just built it all myself. So there you go, all the new animations. So trying to knife enemies, trying to find them. Then the animations for the zombies, which again, tons of game objects, so that was really interesting. Then here I made some really interesting tool to help me with level design. Basically I was able to place the walls as entire solid objects, and then I made some code that looked for all of the 
door objects as well as all of the window objects and pretty much just figure out where to slice the walls in order to make them so that when the game runs and yep there you go everything gets sliced so there are no longer walls on top of doors. That was a really useful tool when it came to level design. Then generally all of the various geometry parts. Again I made a whole bunch of them by myself and then I automatically generated them using procedural generation. Then all the characters going in, then getting attacked by some special infected with some special skills. Again, still a bunch of programmer art with that really ugly car. <laughs> then I started playing around with some lighting effects, so that was really interesting. And again, on the left side, you can see the editor view. So here I was playing with spawning the blood and all the various things. This was another thing that required a lot of work in order to actually make it performant. I actually made a video on how I did this system. Basically, it's a persistent particle system. So I wanted the blood to actually stay on the floor for how long the player lasted on that level. And my solution for doing that was pretty much just generating a mesh. So every time the player shoots a zombie, it spawns out some particles, and those particles are part of the mesh. And that way I can have, I think it was something like 20,000 different blood splatters, and they all rendered on just one mesh, which made them super performant. Then here I've got the intro, so that was fun. Finally got a nice interesting car. So the intro that plays that animation, then they come out, that looks really good. Then this is the death lab mode, which pretty much just randomly generates a nice maze. So this was another thing that was really fun to program. Then trying to add some polish, trying to figure out how to make some nice wheel selection. Then trying to add some sets, trying to improve the visuals to the best of my ability that is and trying to make a nice main menu. And yep, so that's the end of the trailer, so that's the game. Real interesting, and we can see over here on the end, so the asset count, these are, I think it was the files on pretty much the entire assets folder. So that went up to 2400, so that's nice. And the lines of code were 30,000. It's kind of funny how just recently I did a sprint in order to make the actual demo for my game, Dinky Guardians. And for that, I wrote 16,000 lines of code in about two weeks. Whereas over here, it took me about one year to write 30,000, and these were not on the same level of quality as the code that I write nowadays. So if this was on the same level of quality, then these 30,000 would probably be around 15,000. So it's kind of funny how 10 years ago, it took me one year to build a game like this. Whereas nowadays, with my current skill set, I could build this in probably maybe a month. So yeah, this was the development of my very first Steam game, Survivor Squad. The game actually had to go through Steam Greenlight, so this was their service where you had to get a ton of votes in order to actually get on Steam. So the game, I finished the initial version of the game right around May, but back then I was only able to actually sell the game on my website, so it took me until November to make my very first Steam launch. So in total, it did take about one year to build this game. I started it around the end of December 2012, so that was when I first encountered Unity. And pretty much one year later, here it was on Steam, and that's pretty much how I became a professional indie developer. It's definitely an interesting game, I still quite enjoy the mechanics. The reviews, as you can see, are mixed, which for a first game, 67%, honestly, I'm pretty happy with that. And using these same mechanics, I actually then expanded upon it and made a direct sequel. Now, this one did not do as well, but in terms of the technicality, in terms of the game, I was really happy with how this one came out. If you like the concept of that field of view mechanic, then maybe go try out the game. I've got a bundle on the website containing pretty much every single one of my game, including the two Survivor Squad games. And don't forget to add my upcoming game, Dink Gardens, to your wishlist. Alright, so this was a fun video. I really enjoyed rewatching this. I hope you found it interesting to hear my comments on this learning journey. I can't believe it's been 10 years since I actually made this. Now perhaps in 10 years I'll look back into this video. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.